at this point, I will move to the second part of my presentation, and uh, I will define the radiologist's point of view concerning these pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. As a radiologist, the aims of imaging are, of course, detection, characterization, staging, defined as uh, evaluation of the extent of the tumor, and follow-up. There are two major differences concerning functional and non-functional pinets. In fact, the major aim for functional pinet is detection, because these tumors are small inside, one, two centimeters, so they are difficult to be found. Concerning non-functional pinets, these tumors tend to be large, so the detection is not problematic. The problem is to the differential diagnosis, so the characterization of this tumor, the differential diagnosis with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Of course, also staging and follow-up are important, and are important mainly for non-functional pinet, more for non-functional pinet rather than for functional pinets. And we have a number of imaging modalities to study this neoplasma. We can arbitrarily divide these imaging techniques into four levels. The first levels include typically ultrasonography with contrast enhanced ultrasonography, multi-detector computer tomography, and MRI. The second level, mainly nuclear medicine. At the, at the third level, endoscopic ultrasound. Today, we perform extremely rare, rarely angiography and venous sampling. At the fourth level, we put intraoperative ultrasound, that is which is important for surgeon. The typical feature, well, typically these lesions are hypervascular masses, large in size, like in this specimen. But there are other typical features that are more clinical features, such as the good general condition of this patient, in spite of the stage of the tumor, and the presence of liver metastasis at diagnosis. Then we have a negative neoplastic marker, negative CI 19.9, and this is a useful diagnostic tool to differentiate from pancreatic adenocarcinoma in which this marker is elevated. We can have elevation of other markers like chromogregnin A, which is more typical for this type of tumor, for neuroendocrine tumors. So the key point is the differential diagnosis between non-functions versus pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And we know that there are a number of features concerning the type of growth, which is expansive in the case of neuroendocrine tumor, while it is uh, infiltrative in case of adenocarcinoma. The size, which is large in general, compared to the small medium size of adenocarcinoma, margin relatively sharp, ill-defined in case of adenocarcinoma, structure more homogeneous, pancreatic duct generally not involved, so not dilated, and the, the last one, the vascularity. The vascularity is probably the most important imaging findings to make this differential diagnosis between non-functional versus pancreatic adenocarcinoma. It is typically elevated in case of this tumor, low in cases of adenocarcinoma. So at US, we will see relatively large masses, hypoechoic, with hypervascularity that can be demonstrated already at color Doppler, as in these two examples, but can be better demonstrated with contrast enhanced ultrasound. Without contrast, with contrast, you see a definite increase of the vascularity of this pancreatic mass, which is typical for this type of tumor. But this appearance, this appearance is seen in all the modalities. So we have the same case examined with ultrasound, CT, and MRI, and we see the hypervascularity of the mass in contrast enhanced ultrasound, in multi-detector computer tomography, in magnetic resonance imaging. So the most typical feature is hypervascularity. But uh, we have additional features more recently with MR, we have learned that these tumors tend to be hyperintense or relatively hyperintense in T2-weighted images, especially in fat-saturated T2-weighted images, and they tend to have high signal 
on diffusion-weighted images and low signal, low values on ADC maps. And this is probably due to the high cellularity of this tumor, which reduces the motion of water molecules. So we have this very high signal intensity, which is higher than that we observe with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. But the most typical feature is hypervascularity. This is the most frequent finding. It, it was seen in 70% of our cases. So when we are seeing lesions like this, these large hypervascular masses, the diagnosis is easy because only few hypervascular tumor at the pancreatic or duodenal level have this characteristic, this hypervascularity. These are two additional examples, a large mass involving the body and the tail of the pancreas with hypervascularity at contrast and CT, another case with the correlation, with anatomic correlation of a mass located in the tail of the pancreas with hypervascularity at contrast enhanced MRI. There are other lesions which can be hypervascular at the CT or MRI, so we have to keep in mind some differential diagnosis, but all these lesions are extremely rare, like acinar carcinoma, anaplastic adenocarcinoma, renal cell carcinoma metastasis, which are typically hypervascular, duodenal gist, and rare cases of serous microcystic cystadenomas with solid pattern. These tend to be hypervascular, but are really very rare. In some cases, or whether non-functional peanuts are hypovascular, this has less frequent appearance. It was seen in about 30% of our case, cases, and the diagnosis is more difficult, especially the differential diagnosis with pancreatic adenocarcinoma in cases like this or this, the differential diagnosis may be difficult. We st can still make the hypothesis of a large neuroendocrine tumor in this case because there is a large mass, no homogeneous, but in cases with this appearance when we see a hypovascular mass in the tail of the pancreas, I think that the, the differential diagnosis cannot be made. There are other rare appearances of these tumors. The cystic appearance is extremely rare. We see in less than 5% of cases, and the diagnosis is even more difficult for cases like this because we know that in the pancreas there are other cystic masses. We have the pseudocyst and these cystic tumors like the serous cystadenoma, the mucinous cystadenoma, the solid pseudopapillary tumor, and rare cases of retroperitoneal cysts that are, which are to be considered in the differential diagnosis. We have to keep in mind that the non-functional peanuts can be incidental, and this occurred, occurred in 22% in our series of 269 cases. This probably is increasing, the incidental detection of this type of tumors is increasing today. In general, these lesions are small in size, like in the example I'm showing you at the CT, and have an appearance more similar to that of a functioning tumor, like insulinomas, which are small in size and hypervascular. An example of a tumor seen at MR with the hypervascularity in the arterial phase and restriction of free water molecules at the DY with a typical hyperintensity. Well, coming back to the VHO classification, I remember you that uh, this classification distinguished the behavior into benign, benign low-gray malignant or borderline and high-gray malignant. And this distinction is based on metastasis, invasion of surrounding organs, tumor size, angio invasion. Well, we tried to see if uh, we were able to predict the benign or malignant nature of this tumor basing on a series of cases examined by magnetic resonance imaging, and these data were published last year in European Radiology. Uh, in this series, we could show that there are some features that can predict the benign nature or the malignant nature. And first of all, the, the diameter. In our series, the, the diameter was 20 millimeter for this lesion, while for malignant lesion was 71 millimeter, and this difference turned out to be statistically significant. 
Of course, there were other characteristics like the presence of vascular encasement, irregular margin, and extrapancreatic spread. But this is an important parameter, as you will see also in the next presentation by Professor Bassi. So, an example taken from this presentation from this paper, a typical small lesion with sharply demarcated margin. This was a benign neuroendocrine tumor, while these two examples show invasion of the surrounding organs, in this case of the kidney, a large neuroendocrine tumor, and extrapancreatic spread with multiple liver metastases. These two were high-grade, non-functional neuroendocrine tumors. So in general, we can predict the diagnosis. And uh, when we have typical imaging feature of this type of tumor, we proceed with surgical exerases and intraoperative histological confirmation. But in non-typical cases, about 30% of our cases, other imaging is required, and ultrasonography or endoscopic ultrasound guided biopsy has to be performed for make a final characterization of the lesion. Moving to the second level, imaging techniques, Nuclear medicine has an important role, as it, well, it is well recognized that nuclear medicine has an important role in this type of tumor. It is based on somatostatin receptor scintigraphy, but actually gallium, dotatoc, or dotanot, PET CT is preferred in most centers. Other techniques are based on DOPA PET, which is already preferred for carcinoids and the pheochromosatomas rather than pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. These techniques have greater sensitivity compared to FDG PET, or whether FDG PET has its importance in the definition of the aggressive behavior of this tumor. So nuclear medicine is important for detection of small neuroendocrine nodules, for their characterization, like in this example, in which we see the small lesion in the head of the pancreas with positivity at the gallium pet. It is important for staging. It is also important for selection of patients for peptide receptor radionuclear therapy and for the follow-up of this lesion. Moving to the staging, the staging of this tumor is performed according to the rules we follow for pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So the uh, staging is the same of that of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So we have to try to define the tumor resectability based on the evaluation of the extension of the surrounding organs, mainly arterial and venous vessels, liver metastasis, and distant lymph nodes. This is performed by means of uh, CT or MRI, CT is preferred to define the vascular involvement, like this involvement of the mesenteric artery or the celiac axis. It is useful to remember that this type of tumor can involve also the veins. And we, here we have examples of a portal vein involvement. This is a large tumor involving the portal vein this represents not a contraindication, as you will see in the next presentation, for surgery, because this tumor can be removed. But you have to define the degree of extension of this tumor thrombus inside the, the veins. This is another large neuroendocrine tumor which had involved both the splenic vein and the portal vein. This is rather characteristic of large tumor. Of course, as I have already said, this tumor can have liver metastasis. And uh, we remember that 32% of these cases presents already with the liver metastasis. These metastases tend to be multiple, hypervascular, like the original tumor. And of course, they will be hypervascular at CT, at contrast enhanced ultrasonography, and at magnetic resonance imaging. Metastasis can be multiple and even large in size. And in this uh, application, um, PET CT, especially PET, gallium PET, is very useful to define the presence of the, the lesion, of course, but the presence of multiple liver metastases and uh, additional lymph nodes. This is another case in which uh, 
PET CT could demonstrate a distant lymph node and a distant metastasis at the level of the C spine. We evaluate the performance of a multi detector computer tomography versus magnetic resonance imaging. This data we are presented very recently. And uh, we evaluated 51 patients, uh, 27 of them with G1, 19 of them with G2, and five of them with G3 grade of tumor. You can see that uh, this tumor presented uh, vascular invasion in about half of the cases of G2 and three out five cases of G3, while positive nodes were seen mostly with the G2 and G3 cases. However, you can see that also a minor number of cases had positive nodes, although they were G1. Liver metastases were present in half of the cases of G2 and the G3 tumors. Concerning the performance of CT and MRI, both techniques had good results in terms of sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. The accuracy for CT ranged from 86% to 92% concerning vascular invasion and liver metastasis, while that for MRI ranged from 80 to 94%. The results were therefore very similar. There was a, only a difference in terms of significance. The results of M MDCT were superior to that of MR in, con in the evaluation of vascular invasion. So today, CT is still a little bit superior to MRI in the evaluation of the vascular involvement. Finally, I come to the follow-up. The follow-up is also important because these patients have a long survival. In some cases, a very long survival. So the follow-up is important. It is performed by means of CT and or MRI, and of course by PET-CT. And we have to define the response criteria according to the RESIST or the MRESIST criteria, which define the complete response, the partial response, the progressive disease, and stable disease. Just two example. Or one example of partial response, it consists in the reduction of the gray state diameter of at least 30% compared to the pretreatment size, while disease progression consists in an increase of the greatest diameter of 20% or more new lesion. In this case, we saw a decrease, a partial decrease of the tumor, but we saw also the appearance of metastasis in the liver and in the, spin, in the spleen, so we have disease progression in this patient. So to conclude, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor represents an area in which diagnostic imaging has made significant improvement in the diagnosis. Today, we can say that uh, this type of tumor are detectable in most cases by imaging, or whether advanced imaging technologies, and most important, accurate imaging techniques are needed for optimizing the diagnosis. And the integration of more imaging techniques, ultrasound together with contrast-enhanced ultrasonography, together with CT or MRI, nuclear medicine, and endoscopic ultrasound, is necessary in order to reach the best results. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.